You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. My name is Alan Weitz. Greetings. Today we're going to talk about some of the more interesting cameras, lenses, and related gear announced since New Year's 2016, which is why we're calling this New Gear for the Mid-Year. Joining John Harris and I today are the inimitable Levy Tenenbaum. Levy is a senior photography sales trainer at B&H. Also joining us today is Zev Zlotkin, who in addition to being an avid photographer, and Gearhead is one of our Crackerjack navigation architects here at B&H. Zeb and his teammates create and administer all of the landing pages, web categories, and category refinements on the B&H website. Welcome. Thanks for the intro, Alan. Ah, pleasure. By the way, when you have a moment, tweet us your favorite camera gear of 2016 at BH Photo Video with the hashtag BH Photo Podcast. So here we are. It's mid-year, new gear, and uh, let's start talking with about cameras. What's top of your list? It's the K1, the Pentax. Okay. On the K1, I looked up this morning online. Mm-hmm. We have 25 reviews, all five-star, solid five-star 25 reviews from our customers on that camera. So they're loving it. Yeah. I got into Pentax in the late 90s when the 43 millimeter came out. I was just intrigued by that lens, and I, I wanted it. And I bought a small body, a ZX5N, a small film body. And it was a pleasure to use. And when we got to digital, my first digital SLR was the SDS. Talking about, I don't, still don't know how to pronounce that camera. You know, SDS. By the way, that was an error, that name. Did you know yeah, that? It I really I was. I don't know what. Yeah, somebody right. put asterisk down and they thought <laughs> that was part of the name. And it just became, <laughs> and nobody knows how to say it. I still don't know. So anyway, <laughs> my first digital SLR and my first digital camera period, it was great. And then, you know, no one was making full frame then. So we were all in the same boat. I still can't believe it took this long. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. 2007, 2008, what a time of change that was. You didn't realize the things that would be happening. The iPhone came out. The first first, uh, uh, Android phone came out. The first mirrorless camera came out. If you went to sleep then and woke up now, Mm -hmm. you're in a different (laughs) world. So I would have taken a K1 then. Now... I look at this camera, it's incredibly well specced and featured, yeah. and uh, I don't know if I just, I, I would have ran for it then, but now. Um, this is like a story of love thing. lost. Yeah. <laughs> this, this so it's, a little, it's a little disappointing because I used to, I used to like, you know, look at my 31 millimeter mm-hmm. and the 43 and the 77. I said, oh, wait till I get a full frame for yeah. this, but too much time passed. I still have those lenses. Yeah. You know, who knows what will happen? Well, that said, though, let's talk to the camera anyway, a little bit. It's, that's it's, just it is a good camera. camera. Yeah, out of the way. That's it. Thank you for sharing, Zeb. <laughs> I had to get that out. This right is a now. safe place. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything – look, I've had it in my hands only once. Uh, they brought it down for us to, sh- to get our hands on. It solid, heavy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it mm-hmm. is a heavy camera. That's, that's a real thing. camera. Yeah, it is a great. real that camera. That's what I love about those. This is a killer camera for – Field work and for anything you do on a tripod, mm-hmm. still life, landscapes, this was made for that. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, I'm sure, are very happy with this. Um, really, I have nothing but good things to say about it, except, let's say, per, I'm speaking for myself mm-hmm. and maybe some other photographers who are not field shooters. I'm, I'm a city guy, mm-hmm. right? So I, I'd hope that Pentex would follow up making another full frame Mm-hmm. And hear me out on this, a smaller, right. more, I could I could live without half the features of this camera. It would still be great. Right. And just, you know, thin it out, make it lighter and smaller. So I could use my 31 and 43 and take it places where uh, I would take a lighter camera, like your right. D750, right. something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's a big thing. It's heavy. Yeah. It's heavier than the 5D yeah. SR. It's, it's heavier than the D810. They're, they're trying to compare way. it with a lot of the pro-level bodies, and what I mean by pro-level bodies is a D5 or a 1DX. And price-wise and some of the specs, yeah, it compares, but no one's buying a pro-level body at $1,700. You know, like, oh, and I, I think we'd all agree that, you know, uh, the K1 can't do what a 
five, that those two cameras do. It's not nearly as fast. It can focus as well. Yep. Um, it has some really interesting features, high ISO, um, the durability of this camera. I don't think anyone's what, calling it into yeah. question. But yeah, this is not – I, yeah. I think they're missing their market. Like what Zevi's saying over here is that if you were to come out with a very – like price is fine. But if you'd come out with a very accessible camera, not something that weighs and feels like a tank, you know, that it would be a lot more accessible to a lot of enthusiasts. You know, right. And I think – and Alan, you have your A7s. You've – Mm -hmm. We've all handled those and used those now for so many years. I couldn't get used to this big camera in my hands. Right. I mean, they feel great. They they're, feel great. They're, they're and it's well made. Perfect, but they're, there's they're big. nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Can, well, we, let, let, can we jump into no, a couple I just of features talk, about the camera? Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What, what does it have that the others don't? The camera is really fascinating. I mean, it's a 36 megapixel and no, or it's got like a subset anti-aliasing filter, which mm -hmm. you can like switch on and off, which mm -hmm. is yeah, very yeah, unique. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's really fascinating, they have this really cool um, pixel shift technology. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which... Everyone is toting it. I know that Deep Review ran a very cool um, comparison between that and I think a Hasselblad um, 50 uh, megapixel um, CMOS. Mm -hmm. And the pixel shift technology essentially is, it's, it's an old idea. It's just the first time we're actually seeing it in a camera body like this. And that's not true. I take that back. Olympus has been doing it for Olympus. a while. But um, in our an SLR. In an SLR, full-frame right. SLR this is the first time we're, we're seeing it. Medium format. They were doing this 10, 15 years ago. Oh, yeah. I remember when they were also doing red um, RGB yes. um, in, in um, yeah. 4x5. But Digital. now we're doing it in consumer cameras, which is pretty amazing. Exactly. So they're taking advantage of two things. One is they're taking advantage of they have this astro shift technology. So there, there's, a, there's a pixel shift technology, and then there's an astro tracker technology, which are both really fascinating ideas. Um, the pixel shift essentially is that the camera shifts over like, I mean, like the nanometers. Sensor. Yeah, the sensor, the sensor sorry. The sensor shifts over by nanometers and it takes four images, composites them all together, and you get a super duper high resolution 36 megapixel image, which really is equivalent to something a lot higher. It's kind of like stacking multiple images together in Photoshop and then, and then getting the extra resolution there. Um, so DP Review actually ran a, a test and it came out phenomenally well we compared to a, like a, a much higher megapixel camera. By the way, it's not a gimmicky thing. Sometimes they come out with these little uh, uh, features that it's really kind of a gimmick. This really is accurate technology. It's not, you're not making up information or data. It really exactly. is recording separate data in different channels and combining it to one solid file. So it's it's not a gimmick. It really does work. It's yeah. beautiful. H Hasselblad had this with the multi-shots. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah, the same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the 200 megapixel multi-shot. Right. Yep. And you, but we should say that this really only helps for works with static subjects. Yeah, that's you're not the, doing portraits with this. Well, no. Right. Anything, Anything that moves. That's going to be yeah. the next big thing. I know Olympus said that, that that's one of the things that they're trying to get right now is that you, if you can hand hold it, which is, you know, that's, if they can pull that off, it's great. Exactly. If even even if your subject had to remi remain semi still, you know, for like a second, well, not a second, but like, you know, a split second, whatever it is, just like a fast, you know, if you could do like a 40th of a second, that'd be amazing. Mm hmm. Let's jump on ahead, guys, to, well, we were just talking Hasselblad. What about the H60, the 100C? Delayed. Delayed. Okay. Uh, um, Hasselblad's doing a really interesting thing with this is that they're offering a free trade-up, which is very fascinating to see them do. So if, you, if you're waiting for your 100C and in the interim you're buying a 50C, they'll allow you to trade in the 50C at, I don't know, what is it, fifteen or $16,000 and get trade-up value to thirty. You know, but you get back exactly what you paid for the camera, oh, wow. mm -hmm. which is really nice of them. And the camera itself, this gigantic camera file itself that they create. Yeah, uh, you know they're they're doing it to quote um, John Harris. Um, they're <laughs> they're still fighting the megapixel war. Ooh. Okay, yeah. <laughs> they're still they're they're still fighting the megapixel war. Phase one came announced their 100 megapixel XF body already in by um, Photo Plus, which was in October. Now Hasselblad's on it. Um, something unique about this camera, they have USB-C in the camera, which is really nice. So that's the first iteration that we're seeing of the new USB oh, standard jack, yeah. um, which will allow you to, you can rotate either way. So it's similar to the Apple Lightning jack that you can put in either way. Um, doesn't matter. And then there's a ton of, ton of transfer protocols that we could actually do over USB-C, but maybe we'll save that to later. But that's going to be very Let's fascinating. Let's talk about it now it's because you think that's going to be, uh, this will be the future? USB-C, one of the things that they're trying to do because they can pass Thunderbolt over it, they can pass audio over it, they can pass USB over it, they can pass HDMI over it. Right. They they want to make it one jack fits all. Right, right. So, And is there any indication that other manufacturers are going to follow suit? 
I don't point. know. Yeah. I don't know. It, it seems like there's enough there for people to buy into. Mm-hmm. So we just got to see if they're able yeah. to make it that one standard. It'd be like having XLR. It'd be yeah. like, great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know about the cameras, but you can see it happening in the computer world and mm-hmm. the mobile products world. It's really catching on fast. Yeah. In, in mobile, you're already seeing phones in China that are going to come out USB C headphone jack. Mm-hmm. And like that's. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Um, as far as the camera itself, I got to play with it the other day. It's nice. It's faster than they've had until now. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think speed is something you really need a camera like I, that. You know what? I, I fully disagree with that point, and, <laughs> but Hasselblad doesn't agree to my idea in that in that they, they really should invest in autofocus technology and actually make those cameras way faster, mm. and they'd be a lot more accessible. Um, as much as people want to say that they're for fashion shooting, if anyone's ever shot one before... They they are terrible. They are well, way no, slow. No, no, no. As long as you are in one place and your model's not moving more than six inches one direction, it's very, very good. Right, center yep. focus. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. No, uh, yeah. Well, medium formats never really been known for for speed. It, it's it. You're moving larger masses of so that's part of the problem. You like a lot more weights being thrown back and forth. Everything's been scaled up. So uh, I'm sure it'll get better with time. But yeah, that is a big issue. No two ways about. Do you think there's much of a future for medium format? I mean, I've been hearing this for so long already. Uh, when I, when I was in my last place of employment, we were real, real big on pushing medium format, and you know, but you know, after, after closing hours, we admit that it's just a matter of time because the 35 millimeter format cameras are just getting so much better. And today, the stuff you can get out of some of the top of the line cameras is is ridiculous. And the only difference I personally see is how you have differences in focal lengths, the way larger formats interpret the image differently than smaller format sensors. But as far as image quality and performance, medium format's kind of like backseat. Um, if we want to get really nitty-gritty for a second and total gearhead techie, um, the, the big argument back in the day, let's, go, let's, go, let's talk about film for a second just so we can understand where this argument comes from. In film, if you had a 35 millimeter negative, you had less information than a fifth, than a two and a quarter negative yeah. had, mm-hmm. right? We all know that. Um, back in the day, when you had a thirty-five millimeter sensor and you packed twelve megapixels on it, and then you had, let's say, a twenty or thirty megapixel leaf aptus back, because um, that's how far back I'm gonna start quoting. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, you had bigger pixels, better wells, and just better light transmission, and better color. Nowadays, with the 50 meg- megapixel sensors that we're seeing on Canon, um, we'll probably see from someone else. So he's got a, so he's got a 42. The D800 was already challenging at 36. Um, their pixel pitch in the medium format, which is the size of your pixels and how much light they're able to gather, hasn't scaled up. Mm-hmm. So they're not really getting all the advantages that they could technically being offered offering on a larger chip. Plus there's a lot of software applications, a lot of firmware things that are also in the background, taking the, sm- the, the quote unquote lesser amounts of light and amplifying it exactly after so, the fact. So they're making up for the losses. By the time it comes up and you see the file, a lot of work has already been done on it in the camera to make up for these you know, deficiencies. Yeah, but that's, that's every company's doing that. But ideally you would find like a Sony a7S has m- gapless sensor mm-hmm. uh, sensor pixels and yeah. it's able to accept more by going to less megapixels it's able to mm-hmm. get light better mm-hmm. bring in light better mm-hmm. and it's that's why it's an ISO beast right. yes um, theoretically medium format should be making these much larger pixels being able to attract much more light into it even if it's a slower system but your color and your dynamic range should shoot through the roof right, right now they're not really shooting through the roof as well as they could be, especially compared to some of the other offerings, whether it's a, D8, a D810, an A7R2 is doing phenomenally well dynamic range-wise, and they're, they're just not competing where I think they could be competing. The one advantage that they still have is, as you pointed out, focal length, and and more than focal length, is more um, depth of field drop-off. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you're shooting an F2 medium format lens, I mean, you know, it's... I, the mathematical equivalent is like one and a half or one, whatever it is. But the, we all know that look is amazing. Mm-hmm. Yes. Let's yeah. uh, let's keep moving here, guys, up to the mm-hmm. – uh, well, let's. we were talking about the Pentax, so let's talk a little bit quickly about the Nikon and the Canon flagships. Let's throw a comment about them. I paid some attention to these. The D500 mm-hmm. is, I think, especially exciting, talking mm-hmm. about long waits. It was a long wait mm-hmm. after the D300S mm-hmm. to get this camera – I, I thought Nikon was riding off that market and staying full frame for all their pro gear, but 
you know, was, they listen. And well, you know, they they might have originally been dragging their feet and then realized. Right. There was enough. There are enough people out there shooting, you know, a needed long mm -hmm. that long reach that APSC gives you. And um, they came in and did a great job. It's a I had, I had it the camera in my hand. They had it. it it's phenomenal. People mm -hmm. love it. People love it. Right? Yeah, they yeah. packed it with features. They did everything that they probably should have done. Yeah. And who's the market? Pro shooters or the pro second summer? camera for a pro shooter? Pro summer. Pro summer. Right. You can have it. It's a, you know, yeah. like a left hand camera for your your D five, mm -hmm. uh, and um, it can even be your main camera. Yeah. Even it's so good that you can even consider shooting APS-C period and for an SLR. And right. what, what's the megapixel on it? Twenty twenty-four. Uh, you know, yeah. I think it's twenty-four. If I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah. One second. We're pulling up the BNH app right now. If you do there not you have go. the BNH app, <laughs> download the BNH <laughs> app. This app, by the by, can I do a plug for the app? Mm -hmm. I love talking about this. Our app was fe was featured at Google I/O a couple weeks ago or a month ago. Um, we've won multiple awards on Apple and Google for this app. If you do not have this yet, download this app. It is amazing. Okay. Will do. But the uh, the D5, we talked about it, what, now, several months ago, uh, Levy? When they were any, announced. When they were announced. Is there anything that, uh, any opinion changes on these two cameras? Are they still... Um, I think I think Sean yeah. and I kind of came out that the 1DX Mark II, as exciting as it was, was more evolutionary. Mm -hmm. It wasn't mind-boggling, no huge breakthrough over there for Canon. Um, some nice stuff, but no massive breakthrough, mm -hmm. whereas... Well, the video was good. That was the yeah, idea. the video was really nice. Um, the D5, on the other hand, seemed like Nikon it really got a chance. Yeah, yeah, Nikon really got a chance to shine. If you saw a DP review, I mentioned that. Yeah. We mentioned them before. They just finished a review of the D5. Um, very favorable review. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll have to take their word for it, yeah. but they were very impressed by it. Just for... Yeah. I think it's 20.9 megapixels. The, D5, the yeah. D500. The D500. Oh, okay. That's so, right. That's yeah, but it's, right. like, it's yeah. like shooting 4K. It's got time lapse. I mean, it's just, it, it's, as Zevi pointed out before, it's exactly the camera that they need to make right now. Can we switch gears quickly, or not quickly, but let's switch gears mm -hmm. to uh, the Laika MD, and I'm going to throw this into the mix, the Impossible uh, One I1 instant camera. And this was, you know, this kind of getting to the point that we talked yesterday about how we have these incredibly high-resolution, high-tech cameras. But at the same time, there's this lo-fi thing going on, and people are turning to film cameras, instant cameras, and in the case of the Leica, a camera that doesn't even have an LCD in the back. So, and on Instagram, you have, you know, throwback filters, which are extremely yeah, of popular. Course, of course, so. absolutely, absolutely. So so we have these kind of dual trends. Uh, what do you guys know about the impossible I1? Anything? You know, I took a look at it. Um, Has I, anybody actually handled it? I've just no, seen never touched it. Okay. I, I just want to point out it's really fascinating in that it's an impossible camera, so it shoots the Polaroid type film, mm -hmm. instant film. But then it's got Wi Fi and, and, and Bluetooth. So. Oh, I didn't know that. That's wild. Yeah. Okay. You can do some control from your phone, from your tablet. Okay. Fascinating. You mean for mix. remote control of the camera? Yeah. Th okay. Yeah. But it doesn't record an image digitally that you can then send. I don't remember if you can I don't transfer. think it does that. Okay. I, don't, I, don't think no. so. I don't think there's a sensor yeah. in there. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah, is yeah. Polaroid 600. Mm -hmm. Looks like an old rotary phone missing. Yeah, it does. Yes. Yes. It does and it's even like shaped that. like that because like, yeah. it looks like a little pyramid yeah. going on yeah, top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's an old Bell phone, yeah. Bell Labs phone. I think it's pretty cool. And, you yeah. know, I've used the Fuji Instax and... Uh, I'm, I'm, on board. Are great. I'm on board with this, you know. What's I, nice about have, these yeah. kind of cameras is that if you use them in the right context, specifically like a party, there's no way you could take a picture of somebody with a camera like that and not having them hamming it up or smiling. There's no way you stand in a straight face when somebody aims one of these things mm -hmm. at you because yeah. it's such a goofy camera and that's yeah. part of the appeal of it. They're for fun. Really but yeah, an, artist, fun. an artist are using them too and, and doing interesting things. So it's a magic to Polaroid that's always going to be there to an instant picture. Impossible. It's far, yeah. <laughs> it's far exactly, I stand corrected, yes. Um, that you'll never get, yeah, you could look at the picture on the back of an LCD, but it's not the same thing as holding this little print that doesn't go away when you turn the camera. I know. Off. Now, so talking talking about looking at the back of an LCD, yeah, Leica came out with the MD Type two sixty two with I love no it. back. You know, Alan loves it. I, I love it. I am first of just... all, first of all, you remember this is from the same company that a couple of years ago came out with a, a commemorative, a limited edition camera. For Hello Kitty and Playboy. Playboy, yes. I mean, come my on favorite now. camera. Okay, <laughs> that can't, really. Like has done some bizarre things in there, Tom. Just in these limited, but this is kind of special. Now, the funny thing about this is that we spoke about this yesterday. I mean, you could take any, pretty much any digital camera and just turn the screen off. 
yeah. and achieve the same effect. If you yeah. want to be disciplined, say, I don't want to be distracted. But the fact that Leica did this, and they actually created a camera that's not inexpensive, that you have to go home and just like in the good old days, you can't get instant gratification. You have to go home. You have to do something else. You can, it's just not right there. And I love that whole aspect of it. Whether it's sane to spend that kind of money for it, that's another issue. I don't know. Uh, but I happen to love it. I think it's exciting. And, um, you know, if, if I win the lottery, I'm probably going to buy one. And then I'm going to bring it to a jeweler and have him engrave that little Hello Kitty symbol on it. <laughs> they made, uh, they made know, a thousand a, of those. <laughs> I, I, I tell you right now, it is my favorite camera just because I think that the collusion of Hello Kitty and Playboy exactly. is the funniest thing. Yes, <laughs> yes. Leica, I'll say this. I have a lot of respect for Leica for coming out with products that they just don't care what anyone's going to say. <laughs> they come yes. out with these. They're going to do it no matter what. And they're actually for a very conservative company or they at least have that. Mm-hmm. That that appeal is a very conservative, old fashioned company. They come out with their own medium format system mm-hmm. from the ground up. Mm-hmm. It was an yes. amazing thing for them to yes. do. Mm-hmm. The Leica SL, I think, right. took us all by surprise. A right. brand new mirrorless right. where they had yeah. the M already, the Q, mm-hmm. this XU camera, which we might yeah. talk about. And they were a very <laughs> tiny company. They're a tiny company. And they do these things, all these strange additions for like monochrome cameras. Who yep. else is doing that? Yes. Right. So Red. Well, oh, yeah. right. Okay. <laughs> well, I love the idea of the monochrome. That makes sense somehow to me. But to have one, a digital camera without the LCD, when you can just, as Alan said, turn off an LCD, I'm not quite sure I get that. But there yeah, are... the, the the LCD I think takes me for surprise. When you when you have a digital camera, you take that away. It's it's almost the most important thing. Obviously, okay. customers wanted this. They got enough feedback you from yeah. you know their shooters or people mm-hmm. in the like a land who want that. Yeah. They've yeah. done it before. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure they've done it. This before. is not. This is the second camera yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So we'll but leave it at that. I guess with, I guess the commonality for me with the Impossible Project is that they're again a company doing what they want and mm-hmm. coming out with, you know, resurrecting these films and getting these right. cameras refurbished and this this I right. one camera. Yeah. They they're just in it. Everyone has respect for this. Yeah. Well, they're no? just they're doing what they want. Yeah. Um, Good to see. Okay. By right. the way, as a little side note here, uh, I have a Kickstarter campaign going on right now <laughs> that we're manufacturing little three-inch uh, strips. They're made out of black leather red with a little frame on it, mm-hmm. and adhesive, and it goes on the back of any LCD, and you could turn any camera you have into an MD-type camera. <laughs> All right? Kickstarter campaign was starting in about three weeks. I'm working on it feverishly right now. And well, talking about affordable. companies that are doing their own thing, <laughs> how about Sigma? I mean, oh yes, they're, the SD Quattro... They are in the SD Quattro age. They're getting into the mirrorless business, and you we all know SD about their deep nasty quattro. You just did something. Did I say the nasty quattro? The quatro? nasty quattro. <laughs> I, that's by, by the way, that's going to be the name of this product I'm coming out with. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the Sigmas. Anybody? They they are chasing Foveon like it's nobody's <laughs> business. Yeah. And there are some interesting things that come out of Foveon. Yeah. I like the DPs, and there, and, and there are challenges yeah. with yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they're definitely. It's heavy. I don't I mean, think that they're winning any design awards with these cameras. No, no, no. no. but still. But yeah. Foveon is good technology. I agree with you. It it has been at the core of it. Problem with the Sigma, they make good lenses. They make a lot of great lenses. These Quattro's, mirrorless cameras that take big SLR lenses. I just it it just doesn't work for me. Yeah, it's I, I, I. What's what's I, more shocking to me? That. What's more shocking to me is they're still beating this Sigma mount. I, I, I don't know the if they mode. can't get licensing, licensing from one of the other companies, but they should just sell this with a converter to Canon lenses. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, that that's what I would do. Mm-hmm. And I would right, get rid of the right. Sigma mount completely. And what's also interesting is they have the they have the Quattro and the, the Quattro H, and the mm-hmm. Quattro H is going back to this like 1.3 crop that we used to see in like the original BSH. 1Ds. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is also just a weird, like it's a weird format at this point in time. Mm-hmm. It were, I guess they were able to produce both. Someone who wants a larger sensor can get it, but I don't know. Yeah. It's yeah, not weird. it's a it's a mirrorless camera with a SLR lens. But yeah. two points for Pentax the, for tried they that. Did it. The yeah. KL one it did, didn't work. Remember the KL one the that yellow camera? Like us oh, doing yeah, it with yeah, the yeah, SL. Yeah, yeah. It was a mirrorless mm-hmm. camera that took yeah, you know, no. SLR lenses. Yes. It didn't huh. work. All right, well we'll leave that at there and go to well, let's talk Sony. We got the the RX ten Mark III, yep. the A6300. So a couple interesting things about Sony. They're, two of their imaging factories are down. One of them is really massive factory. One of them is a smaller factory. One of them is shut down indefinitely, and, and, and the initial reports were, but they still had enough imaging stock 
to supply the demand. That's what the claim was at the time. They also happened to be 40% of the market for imaging sensors. And they're and so they're, they're half of their stuff is down. So it ends up being like 20% of the imaging market worldwide is out of production right now. Hmm. So it's like, it's just a crazy amount if, wow. if we try to wrap our minds around it. At the same time, as time is going on, we're, you know, it's trickling out more and more delays and then not delays and then delays and then not delays. I mean, I know our buyers are going a little crazy because they're not sure whether or not there's going to be stock or there will be stock. And there's a lot of other companies that rely on it, as Al- as Alan pointed out earlier. Like, I don't know if the DLs for Nikon are using Sony sensors, but I know that the DL keeps getting delayed. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, now at the September, October, we're supposed to be at the end of June. Exactly. That's bumped off. Let's as, talk about, yeah. can we talk about the DL really quickly while yeah. we're here? Okay, what Great do you have to say about it? Yeah. I love them. And and a, new format, a new format for... Yeah, yeah. smart yeah. idea. Mm-hmm. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm down with them. Okay. Smart idea. All right. Dev? Yeah, uh, one-inch sensors are the... That's, okay. That's... That's where we're going to be beginning and they're from. Fi- and, all and fixed lens, like three, cameras. three cameras. different cameras, yeah. three, three different focal cameras, lengths, three different three focal, focal length ranges. Okay, right, yeah, right. right. Including mm-hmm. a wide angle zoom, which is really interesting. Yeah, Zeva, you were you liked the RX10 Mark III? You were saying that yesterday. You were pretty excited about it. Amazing, a lot of great stuff in that one okay. package. Right. I mean, what, you got the one inch sensor, and you got an amazing lens with what twenty eight to twenty four to six twenty four to six hundred f four. It's fast. Yes, wow. two eight to f four. It's a very you know f four mm-hmm. at the at the long end. Mm-hmm. Great video. People are shooting great video with a it. A reasonable physical size okay. and weight. Yeah, I mean when you add it up, I mean mm-hmm. for what it is. It's, it gives you so much in the light it's package. It's true all-in-one. Usually mm-hmm. all-in-ones mean they yeah. do a lot of different things not well. This one actually does a lot of things uh, well. So the RX-10 is like a very interesting market. I think even Sony's not 100% sure what market the RX-10 fills because when it first came out as a 24 to 200, 2.8 yeah. constant, but it had tremendous video capabilities. I mean, it still has tremendous ca- video capabilities, 4K, constituting AV- uh, XAVCS. I mean, it, just, it shoots phenomenal video. I, mean, I think in S log, I mean, just it's just a crazy video camera. So, photographers didn't know what to do with it because it was twenty four two hundred two eight, but it came out at like fifteen hundred bucks or whatever it was. It was too expensive for a lot of people who were looking at that kind of power zoom style camera. Um, whereas videographers were looking at it and saying like, "This is fantastic. That's a photojournalist. I can take this anywhere. It's a two eight, and it's mm-hmm. an all in one camera, and I can shoot stills with it also that are acceptable for publication." So. It, it, it kind of is feeling like this really interesting place where I think it's more focused toward like photojournalists or like people who need like an all in one camera, like on location and do a lot of shooting. This camera now, though, with the 24 to 600, could even fill that kind of all in one zoom area for photographers because you have that power zoom now. You have very long zoom range. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still expensive. It's still it's still kind of up there in price wise of what you would see compared to other cameras in this kind but of power But the amount of right. photographic power that you get, the amount Tremendous. of imaging abilities that you get, there's not very much you can't do with that focal length and with that imaging sensor. Exactly. It's no Nikon P90, so it's not it's not going to give you that thousand times zoom. Mm-hmm. But nine hundred. Nine hundred. Sorry, yeah, yeah. nine hundred. Yeah. Um, but it like. Firstly, this this camera dropped like total surprise. I had no idea that it was happening. Someone like mentioned to me, "Hey, you heard about the RX10 Mark III?" And I thought that they were messing with me because Sony, you know, announces something new every other day. Right. Yes. But usually, there's 500 rumors about what's coming out, so you kind of know what's happening. And this literally hit me by surprise. I said, "What are you talking about?" I ran downstairs, looked at my computer, said, "Whoa, they they've done this, and this is a such an interesting camera." First time that they're doing 4K still grab. Mm-hmm. I think it is in pre-record for for 4K, which is really cool. And just a 600 f4 for 1500 bucks. Yeah, I mean, in the end, it's still a one inch sensor. So yeah. I, I guess I agree. On the one hand, it takes a better photographer or videographer to appreciate what this does. Right. I don't think it's a beginner's all in one travel zoom. I guess you could use it that way, but a more advanced photographer will appreciate its features. Then, when you take a second look, you say it's still just one inch. Right. I might need my other cameras for right. You know, with depends better lenses. What it depends what you're what doing. You need. Yeah. It's a secondary. I don't know if it's a primary camera. It just depends on what you're. If you're a videographer, to. this could be a primary camera. I mean, as long as you have the batteries to support it. Yeah. Mm. And also, I, I, I think I'll throw in if you want to go back to still photography. I think if you are a, 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 a amateur or consumer, and you want to have a camera that'll do a lot of things very, very well, it's a perfect choice. I'm going to interrupt yeah. here to throw out just to mention the A6300, and then. Let's jump to the Olympus Pen F, mm-hmm. and then we'll wrap it up for this segment. Uh, but anyone have something about, to say about that? A6300, just wow. Yeah. Okay. 
What what a great camera. Um, super fast, great sensor, great video capabilities even. Um, if you've ever done autofocus on this camera, it is tremendously fast. I'd say the one holdback on this camera, it's been the same thing with the A6000, is that it buffers out just way too fast. It is mm. shooting 11 frames per second. It is just blazing fast. But you buffer out in literally like <laughs> one small burst. So you're going like, wait a second. I thought I had more pictures to do. Long. Well, turn the clock back not very far and people go, that's awesome. I don't need anything else. Of course. And of course, we're spoiled again. Yeah. Well, as Evie said, if this was 2008. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the Olympus Pen F? That's also, it's a new camera and that's, that's pretty hot too. That's nice. Beautifully designed camera. Mm -hmm. Just look at it. The minute I saw that picture, I said, wow, that, that's nice. Even I, I go for that. I'm not Micro Four Thirds. Olympus shoot. does a nice, elegant design. They're, they're form factors. They finally did. Yeah. For a number of years, they had these EPL, what this EPP, mm -hmm. EPL cameras. Right. And none of them had built-in EVFs. It was a real weakness. So a real photographer, you know, a, a, a more enthusiast photographer wants, likes to have a viewfinder. And none of them were there. You could buy external it's not, ones. It's, it's, it not even, it's not even pro um, photographers that need an yeah, right, EVF. I'm, I'm, right, exactly. Yeah. It's just an enthusiast photographer, a committed photographer wants an EVF. You need yeah, it sometimes. You need it, yeah. So here you go. You they it, finally yeah. put one in the camera, a nice one. And um, it just resonated so well, the design. And it's a fun, it takes great images. I've seen mm -hmm. stuff online, mm -hmm. uh, just a fun camera to be creative with and just to take everywhere. Mm -hmm. And great it's, lenses. Yeah, the and lenses. fantastic the lenses. lenses are fantastic. Okay. Um, there's no getting around that. All right, so, speaking of lenses. Yeah. We're going to take a short break and we come back. We're going to be talking about lenses. We are back. Okay, lenses. Let's start talking. Uh, uh, we got a whole list of lenses here. Let's start talking about Sony. Uh, the two of them that we put on our list are the 50 FE18 and the 70 to 300 45 to 56. What's so? What's so special about these? They finally got a thrifty 50. <laughs> Actually, there's nothing very special about a 518. Everyone's had them for a long time, but now Sony's in the game with that, and I agree. Uh, with Levy that it, it hits the market, part of the market which they were kind of neglecting. I'd love to see an A7 Mark III, like packaged with, with a 2870 and the 7300. That's a nice way to get into Sony full-frame mirrorless without you know, breaking the bank right. for the better, the, the, the 7S and the 7R2. Um, it takes 1500 bucks. What a great way to is, get into full-frame. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So with, with lenses like this, you could, mm -hmm. you know, someone yeah. could, an enthusiast could really get into it. Now you mentioned the seventy to three hundred. We weren't kind of talk about that, but you you kind of insisted. What yeah, do you the, think? You know what? Yeah. Their longest lens now. Yeah. So even you know they don't have a three hundred anything. Mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 mirrorless. in mirrorless. In mirrorless. Yes. In their own system. Yes. Um, I wish though. I, I think going back to the A sixty three hundred, which we spoke about, such a small and compact camera. I wish now if you want a telephoto for that from Sony, you kind of have to get. This would be a logical choice, but mm -hmm. it's quite a large for a camera like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know now that Sony seems to be sticking with APS-C. We're going to cameras for a second. With APS-C cameras is, are going to stay alive in the 6300 series, 6000, 6300, or whatever's coming next. You know, maybe they should think about making a couple of better APS-C uh, lenses mm -hmm. for it, right. so that they don't. This camera doesn't have to use oversized full frame lenses. Well, talking about oversized full frame lenses, <laughs> <There> you go. <laughs> this is a great segue to their G Master series, okay. which everyone I know we were all waiting for it for finally them to go wide aperture um, in all the standard focal lens. So there's a 24 to 70 2 8, there's a 70 to 200 2 8, and an 85 1 4. Mm -hmm. Sony, if you're listening, <laughs> you need, I don't know if there's a, if there's a physical requirement for the lens to be this big. I don't believe so, seeing as Leica is able to put out stuff that's way smaller. So get us small. We, I, need, I a, the, we I, need a bigger camera. 
I have and in I'm hand. Sure that's no, 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 please. No, 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 no. So no, no, no. I want to stay, yeah, stay, yeah. stay with the smaller camera. I want to stay with the smaller camera. Put out lenses with the wider apertures that are smaller. How, do, okay. how does the twenty? I haven't handled the twenty-four to seventy or the seventy-two hundred. How do they compare to the say Nikon and Canon equivalents okay. or Sigma equivalents? So the so the seventy to two hundred is not out yet. I haven't touched it. Okay. The twenty-four what, to seventy. What do you think it'll be? I, I no. think it's gonna be phenomenal. <laughs> I, I, no, I can tell you, I, judging judging by what they've done. Okay. Firstly, the twenty-four to seventy f four, which came out with these cameras, is. I have one. It's a good lens. Yeah, I like if, it. It, it, Stop down a little bit. It. it it works great. Speaking of len- lenses for Sony, the Zeiss Batiste 18 millimeter f2.8. We all love these Zeiss lenses. The Otis, the Batiste, they're great lenses. The optics are incredible. They're doing a great job, okay. Zeiss. Um, right. And the 18 millimeter, I was just telling Alan, that's mm. a. It was a gift. It just you know, it's a special lens that uh, I guess they didn't have to make, mm-hmm. but. Uh, it's great to have an 18 millimeter for those who really want wide. But this is for the full frame. Full frame. Yeah, that's a full frame lens. Yeah, that's oh, a full okay. frame, full frame okay. lens. Okay. All right. And so, it fits. And the form factor is and weight factor are perfect for the A7 exactly. series cameras. Exactly. Okay. They're really, really. Be- they fit beautifully. They they are nice to use. They really, really are. That's great. The, the, the 18 millimeter it feels like 28 millimeter. Like we're we're there's lovers of it, and like not everyone needs it. Like a lot of people I know don't like to shoot 28 millimeter. I think 28 millimeter is a fantastic focal length. 18 is kind of that. People think wider, like, oh, I want 16, 15, 14. But, like, 18 is kind of like, it's a really good space to be in. But a lot, yeah. but it's never been a real popular it's, focal length, though. Right. 18, it's like 28. Yeah, Leica makes ones. And th- I think if you if you look at the numbers from Leica and from Zeiss, 18 millimeters not never been their big seller because people, it's like, yeah, they'd rather go to the 15 or in between. Exactly. Yeah. If you're going to go that far, really go far. Exactly. It's but they're between doing lines, it, but and it's good. It's great. And nice addition. I, I just want to do a shout-out yeah. to Zeiss over here. All their refreshes, their, their Luxia, their Baddest, the Milvis and and um, Otis have all been they're, top they're notch. killing it. Yeah, they're top notch. They're Definitely. maintaining the quality that you expect from uh, uh, that brand. What about the Samyang fourteen millimeter two eight and fifty one four with autofocus? So these are announced. These are not even I think on order have, yet. Right, we don't they're, have them. At they're all. not on the yeah. site. They're I, not on I the checked. Site. No, they're yeah. not. Ah, okay. so these are just announced. Mm-hmm. Um, this is really exciting because um, we're seeing. For, for those of you who are not familiar, it's Rokinon, Samyang, Bauer, um, oh. I think Wally or Wally Max, whatever. There's like four lens companies which seem to be coming out of the same factory in right. Korea. And that's because they are. I think Samyang <laughs> is the parent company. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah that it's is either Samyang yeah. is or Rokinon. One of them is the, is the parent. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but regardless, they, they're, <laughs> they're well known for these budget-type lenses. They have they have some very interesting lenses as far as they're, they're really decently priced. They're, they're your stripped down bare bones kind of things, but they have Man, um, yeah, focus manual confirmed. focus up until now. Yeah, oh, manual yeah. focus up until now, but they have focus confirmed chips. They have cinema lenses, which were very popular in the mm-hmm. HDSLR they mirrorless community. They make tilt shift, the 24 tilt mm-hmm. chip. I've exactly. Used them, they're actually very sharp. Mm-hmm. They are surprisingly sharp, but especially when you compare it to the cost that you're getting them at. Yes. Their, their focus marks aren't always exactly, so this is coming from a, a video shooter. If you go to infinity, sometimes you have to go slightly beyond infinity in order to get there, so you can't fully trust their witness marks. But they're now going into autofocus, which is like cool. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. To, yeah. It's yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. We'll see if this ends up being like the young now of lenses, where <laughs> you know, just super packed and comes out at half the price of what the brands come out at. Well, we were talking about wide angle focal lengths that are maybe odd. And Alan, I know you're really excited about the Voigtlander 10 millimeter. Yeah. So talk uh, about that. It, as soon as we got them into stock, I requested one, and I'm actually doing a, a review on one right now. Um, 50, I've been using 15 millimeter rectilinears for 30 years now, starting with the original Nikons on my Nikon F3s. They made a 5.6 and an F3, 3.5. But what's amazing about it is that uh, anybody who's been shooting digital with wide angle lenses, uh, especially some years ago, you know about the the soft edges and the color smear and everything else. Um, Voigtlander's nailed it. Now, Voigtlander is actually Cosina, and these lenses are made in the same factory as the, a lot of the Zeiss lenses that we're selling that we've been talking about. And Cosina really has been taking notes in manufacturing stuff. And when they bought over the Voigtlander name and started producing these new lenses, mostly in M mounts, uh, they're doing an amazing job. And the new 10 millimeter 5.6, the Hyperhelior, Helior Hyper, I love the name. Um, it does still go a bit soft on the edge, especially wide open, but there's no color smear. Very little vignetting. It has a 130 degree angle of view. It's rectilinear. It does not distort. Zero. If you're working on a tripod, it's easy to do interiors and architecture. And I've been walking around using it handheld and getting 
straight lines, hand holding it. And it's just amazing to use. It requires a little bit of concentration. You're taking in a lot of imaging. You think you're filling the frame with something small. And all of a sudden you see, here's the way I sum it up. When you aim this lens straight ahead of you, at the same time, you're also looking up, looking down, and way left and way to the right. It sees everything. But when the pictures work, it, it, it's amazing what it can do, and it can be used. Here's an interesting thing. It's ultra, ultra wide, and I would say about a third of the photographs I've taken, you would not be aware that I took them with a wide-angle lens. Wow. You showed me some, some of the shots. They look good. And you should mention how well it balances on the camera since it's Oh, beautifully balanced. I'm using it on an A7R2. You, you it's a perfect match. Everything is right yeah. there, uh, and, and it's, you can carry it, it around the whole just day. Right. Yes. It's, you know what? If you're a wide-angle junkie, a lot of people are. This is, this is like your fix. Oh, oh this, 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 you this might actually OD mil. on this one. You, <laughs> let's put this one. To show you how wide this is and how it's fitting, okay, when you put on a, a focus peak, the whole frame turns red, no matter where you're focused. I mean, it's, everything is in focus. It's really insane. But I'm, I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's, I, I own the 15 Voigt Lander, the, the, the new uh, uh, version 3. It's an amazing lens. This is a perfect complement. Um, and what's particularly neat about this, if you put this lens on an APS-C format camera, you have the equivalent of a 15 millimeter. Uh, and it's, another thing I thought about, and, and I've shot a lot of pictures for magazine layouts and for web layouts and pages and things of that sort. What's nice about this, I realize, is that if you are t have to take a picture of a large area and you also have to have space left over, left, right, for, say, uh, headlines or text or inset photographs, this lens is perfect for taking in, a, taking in your subject and still having a lot of space left over where it could be used for dropping in all of these other things. So if, you, if you're working commercially, it's a very good tool for that. You can get all your data into one side of the image and leave the other side just for the art director or designer to drop in with it. That, that's really interesting. What, what's most interesting about this lens is Voigtlander started making stuff directly for E-mount, whereas before yes. we used to be adapting them from M. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an E-mount lens, which is also nice because it talks directly to, to the Sony, which is great. And I hope that Voigtland is looking at their other M lenses and thinking of reworking those for E. Great. There's some great lenses that they've got there. I'm sure oh, they yeah. are. I'm sure yeah, they are. Yeah. 40s and they have 50s and that's 78, mil, 78 millimeter? Mm -hmm. What is that? 75. 75, 18. 18. Yep. Let, Okay. Let's jump yeah. ahead. Sorry, guys. To yeah. the, the, well, I guess the two big third-party lens companies, Tamron and Sigma, everyone's pretty keen on the art series. I think we all agree that they're doing pretty good things. That was the lenses. first thing that came to my mind. But yeah. I have the Tamron SP85 F1.8 and specifically the Sigma 50 to 100 F1.8 and the 24 to 35 F2, the two new Sigma art lenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's uh, for Nikon only? Probably Nikon, Nikon Canon, Canon and SA, probably. No? <laughs> and SA. I believe uh, that is it. Yeah. So. So they're good. Any, anything Maybe else you have the uh, p and app? You can yeah. check that I, for I am looking at that right now. <laughs> I would say, oh, no, they do you have know, Maybe it got announced our, originally for Nikon. Okay. The company, you know, Sigma, Tamron, and Tokina, let's throw mm -hmm. them the old, yeah. let's go the old guard yeah. SLR lens companies. I mentioned this to you a couple of weeks ago, um, just having a conversation about mm -hmm. how these companies seem to be missing the mirrorless market. If you look at what they have for mirrorless, it's, they don't. The heart is not there. Right. They're just not there. They're making great – these art lenses mm -hmm. and these 1.8 zooms and F2 zooms right. are amazing. That's where they are and, you know, they're just not there with mirrorless. So I it's saw, a strange – Well, don't with know Sigma, why, maybe they'll start making some for their own new mirrorless well, camera. Well, they did but, with this yeah. adapter. Yeah. They're selling that their art lenses with an adapter for Sony E. Exactly, mm -hmm. the MC11. Right. Let's hold off on that for a quick second because I definitely want to talk about it. And it's interesting because we hope to be doing an interview with the Sigma people about just this. So this would be um, something curious to bring up with them. Definitely. Right. Um, let's jump quickly to the Lens Baby Twist 60, and then we'll go to gear or miscellaneous gear besides lenses. Yeah, right. so the Lens Baby Twist 60 is really fascinating. It's an optic where you spin around the outsides of your, the edges of your photo. Okay. Um, I used to do this and still do every once in a while. You do slow shutter while you spin the camera and you, right. you know, the center's in focus and the outside is twisting. With the twist optic, you get kind of twist the outside and you get kind of this, this like spiral effect. It's just Pretty funky. Cool. It's, it's like a gimmicky type lens, but that's mm -hmm. that's exactly gimmicky what Lens Baby lens does. Baby? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I want to jump back to the Zeiss um, Battis 18mm 2.8 for a second. Yeah. Because we were talking about this also during the break, is that 
what Zeiss is doing is they're not trying to release like these super wide aperture lenses. Like you're not going to see a one four out of Zeiss or a one two. They're making tremendously sharp across from edge to edge. Just everything is in sync. There's no aberrations. There's no pin barreling or cushioning or anything like that. And that's because that they're u- they're they're doing it at this two eight where they don't have to refine as well. And they're also able to make smaller lenses at that point. Smaller, lighter, better form factors that match mirrorless camera bodies better than, like Zeb was just saying, these are great lens, but they're monstrous. So the, a lot of these ice designs, they're all meant to be for smaller camera bodies. And to me, right. I'm I, sold on that. Yeah. And, you know, when you think about it, depth of field aside, okay, we all have cameras now that have ridiculous kinds of uh, degrees of, of image stabilization. And you don't necessarily need... And high ISO. And high ISO. There's so many ways of getting around all the stuff that, again, unless you need the optical qualities of a very wide aperture. Exactly. But if you're stopping down anyway... It's It works fine. Okay, we're going to take another break, and we come back. We're going to talk about accessories and miscellaneous gear at <clears> the <throat> mid-year. Do that other again really quick? Well, yeah. yeah. All right, and we're gonna and t- say, talk, talk about software and everything else. Just throw yeah, software yeah. in there, too. Okay. Okay, we're going to take a break right now. We come back. We're going to talk about accessories and miscellaneous gear, software, and other neat stuff for mid-year review. Okay, welcome back. All right, we're going to wrap up the last third of the show, talk about uh, gear, accessories, software, all the miscellaneous stuff that we didn't talk about so far. And um, uh, top of the list is the Broncolor Cirrus L. It's a, a new battery-powered flash system from Broncolor. Was it 2 and 400? No, 400 and 800. 400 and 800 watt seconds, which is a lot of power. It means you can go out in the middle of nowhere, miles and miles from an electrical outlet and still take a wonderful studio uh, imagery. Anybody have their hands on that yet? I'm familiar yes. with, the, with the Pro Photo battery Seen packs. This so, is their answer. So this is, this is their answer to it. Um, it's really well designed. I mean, it's a Broncolor. Yeah, uh-huh. Well designed, the way the battery fits in, seamless. It's not, you know, popping out the side, like kind of like the Pro Photo is. Um, no TTL. Which in this day and age. And they say because they don't feel like professionals use it. I think that is the most bizarre statement I've heard out of a company in a long time. I think they were trying dial up for a while, but they had a lot of problems <laughs> with it. I'm not, I, that's just a rumor I heard. Like, I, I'm totally fine with having full manual controls and saying like, there's, you know, there's a lot of us professionals who would never use TTL, but... At Not this day and age, to try to compete with the pro photos, the interfits, and say like, oh, <laughs> we're going to put out something that's more expensive than everyone else, and we're going to strip away TTL. I, 
I, for the life of I don't think it's going to be too long. My guess is there's going to be some kind of an accessory coming out soon because a uh, bronze color is is you know they've been using wireless stuff for a while on on a lot of other stuff and yeah, it's surprising that it's not in this system off the right off the uh, you know as they launch it. But my guess is they're going to be coming out with some kind of an attachment or accessory that will be able to do this. If they're not, it's foolish. Well, it'll probably it'll probably be built into receiver. They'll they'll, they'll make a sorry a transmitter like mm-hmm. a what RF three or RF four that will allow it to do all the transmitting of TTL. Um, the positives of this system are it's a bronze color. It's a really good 400, which it's is... An a, it's accurate it's numbers. Accurate, yeah, it's they, accurate they numbers, shoot the numbers, and their 800 correct. is an 800, and yes. these are blazing fast. I mean, they are... Color they're, they're accuracy, beautiful. the color, no matter what you do, you're going to get consistent color throughout the, first, the range. That's one situation, in one case, where you really do get what you pay for. Uh, it's not just the name the good that, sense. Uh, that's been, yeah. Yeah. you know... It's not. It's not junk. It's it's real good. Real good uh, stuff. Sticking with lights, the Nissan i60A. That's the alternative flash. to this new Broncolor system. <laughs> <laughs> or or not, but this is Nissan's new new flagship full radio TTL. Okay. I mean, yay! It's a good flash. Yeah. All right. Um, radio TTL. So I, this I, I'm just going to bring it up now because I'm okay. talking about it right yeah. here. Um, everyone's doing radio TTL at this point. Right. Um, Nikon now brought out trend one, alert. which is a really right. yeah trend alert. Um, everyone's doing radio TTL, which is why I'm so surprised that the bronze color doesn't have radio uh-huh. TTL. But Photix, Canon's already in the second iteration of it. Um, Nissan's now doing it. Nissan also the i60A is released for da 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 drum roll Sony mount. Mm-hmm. So their Sony, for those of you not familiar, the Sony shoe is a very unique type of shoe. Most manufacturers are not making speed lights for the Sony shoe. This is a flash that's actually made in the size and. The proper set for the Sony E mount shoe, which is something that is very exciting. It's the multi interface shoe. The multi interface right. shoe. And for those of you who don't know, the Sony shoe is actually the original Minolta shoe. <laughs> well, no, they, 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 they changed it. It used to be the Minolta out, shoe. Okay. Yeah. And now they changed the multi interface shoe. One of the biggest problems that manufacturers have with this shoe is that this shoe is slightly deeper because at the front it's made to take pins so that flash any accessory that goes on the top can talk directly to the cameras which is a great benefit of the multi-interface shoe but it's not like your standard hot shoe which you could just slap stuff off and on on which leads to a ton of problems when you're coming to radio transmitters and receivers for flashes i cannot tell you how many times we get phone calls my pocket wizard's not fitting this is not fitting that's not fitting my young now but whatever it is none of them are fitting and that's because this sizing just seems to be slightly different and we've even tested like some of our cameras not a problem Tried out with some of the other cameras, and it is a problem. Mm-hmm. So, okay, uh, the Sigma MC11 adapter you mentioned it earlier. Yep, Sigma MC11. So Sigma had trouble with Metabones and other companies adapting their lenses. Where, it, with all of these auto adapters, I highly recommend that you always look at what lenses are compatible. Yeah, because not always are all lenses compatible. Even lenses from the same manufacturer may not be compatible just due to mm-hmm. whatever. Right. And so Sigma was having trouble with adapters, and so they brought out their MC11, which is an EF to E-mount adapter, which is specifically targeted at adapting Sigma's own lenses. It comes out at 300 bucks, which is $100 cheaper than the Metabones, but it will also adapt over a lot of the popular Canon lenses. What's really nice about the Sigma adapter is twofold. One is you can update the software, you know, which mm-hmm. a lot of the other ones will do. Or sorry, not the software, but the firmware, so you can plug it in via USB. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that's very nice about it, it has a little light on the side, which it will glow green if the lens is fully compatible. Huh. It will go orange if it's like sort of compatible or needs an, or needs right. an update. <laughs> wow. And it will <laughs> not light up if it's, if not, it's compatible. not compatible. Okay. And that is, I got to hand it to whoever's at Sigma. They've definitely used their brains. Yeah. Want to make one recommendation? And this actually comes from Mark Farber, our Sigma trainer. I was talking to him that you should be able to do all your lens updates from there as well. Which right now you still need to use the USB dock for. So you this the adapter doesn't fit with the dock at all anyway. It, it, it's not it's not used in conjunction with the dock. Okay. So it, it doesn't take the place of the dock. Right. You can't do any of the stuff that the dock does. Uh-huh. But I think that that'd be really simple firmware stuff. And then right. Sigma, if you're listening, make this adapter into dock, and you're going to have a tremendous product here. Great. Great. Uh, what about this Tether Tools case relay? We were talking about Strobe before. I was going to follow up with that. Yeah, so Tether Tools, a company known for um, tethering and some odds and ends accessories, made a very interesting um, case relay system, which is essentially your dummy battery into direct power. But, and here's the big thing that they did over here, is that this can go off of a regular USB battery pack like you would use to power your phone. Oh, okay. And you can power your camera. Email, um, Sony um, NF, 
Canon EP, sorry, LP6. So the, oh, the, battery, the LP, yeah. um, Nikon, EN. Mm-hmm. So they have a bunch of like, uh, they have this for, for Fuji as well. Right. Pretty much a lot of location shooters, and especially in the mirrorless, we're always running out of battery. Right. And this is a way to have constant power, particularly if you're doing like time-lapse work. Right. This is a great Oh, system yeah, to have. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, well, that's good yeah. to know. Yeah. That's a, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, and then what about the Atomos Flame and overall HDR monitoring, et cetera? Yeah. So Atomos, for those of you who know what Atomos is, Atomos is a recorder and and screen and monitor. Um, they announced the Flame, um, I want to say a couple of months ago. And the big thing about it was it came out of 1500 nits, so super bright. And as well, they also announced in the flame that it's going to have HDR monitoring, pretty much being able to show the dynamic range that things like the Sony A7S II can capture, the A7R can capture, um, or other high-end, high dynamic range cameras can capture. And the trend over here, because I'm just going to jump to trend because it's right here, is HDR monitoring. You're going to see this on TVs. You're going to see this on monitors. Essentially, now that 4K is kind of coming here and it's kind of here to stay, is the next big step is outside of resolution is to being able to show darker blacks and brighter whites in every color in between. And that's what these are doing. So way more color fidelity, way higher color um, accuracy, and just overall more colors to look at and please your eye with. Right. While you're shooting. While you're shooting or, or, or watching. You watch it too. Right. That matter, TVs are coming out with it. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're going to see this everywhere. GTA, have you, have you had a chance to use the uh, On One Raw yet? No. So On One Raw is announced. Announced. Um, okay, I, I wasn't think, sure about that. Okay. I think it's coming out. I think according to what they were saying, like fall time. Mm-hmm. Um, what? So on one makes a whole bunch of plugins. Really nice set of plugins. They have um, perfect portrait, perfect resize, um, perfect black and white. I mean, just a, they have a great. They can set also of be used standalone. They can you be standalone or plug into Lightroom right. or right. Photoshop? Thank you. Mm-hmm. They've now announced a raw converter, which this is huge because no one else has kind of redesigned raw conversion at this point. Capture One's been around for a long time. DxO has been around for a long time. And as you all know, Adobe has been around for a long time. And for those of you who've been with Lightroom since one, which I've been, it's getting a bit clunky and it's slowing down a bit, especially when you're starting to work with some of these larger file formats, it's particularly the clunky part here and something that on one is looking to remove is that when you have to do ingest, because Lightroom is a catalog and you have to do ingest, that can sometimes take a a little bit of time. What On One is doing is now that we have really powerful graphics cards and a ton of RAM and SSDs and all this other stuff inside of our computers, they want to leverage graphics to be able to make super fast raw processing, be able to see your images right away, do adjustments right away, not have to wait for it to move a slider and then wait for it to adjust or anything like that. They're saying it's 10 years in the making. It's a ground up kind of thing. I think this is going to be a very interesting product when it does land, if it does everything that they're saying it does. You, and you were talking about graphics before. What about the GTX 1080? So GTX 1080, um, for all the computer geeks out there, this is a card that is claiming to be as powerful as the Titan X, which is an $1,100 graphics card. And it's coming out at 599 I think, or $699. Um, it's been announced, yes, we have had millions and millions of phone calls asking when they're going to get their GTX 1080 because apparently we had it on our site available for like 30 seconds mm. and it was <laughs> sold out. Wow. Um, so it's... Is this for this uh, VR is, Play Mac or VR production? This is for 4K. I think it's going to be f- uh, uh, fast enough to do um, VR playback. Um, it's for gaming. Um, I think you can only put two of them into SLI, so you can't do like four cards across SLI, but... People are really – I'm excited about this. I just bought myself a 980. Um, I'm definitely going to wait to see where the 1080 goes and if I need to go there, but it's going to be able to handle a bunch of 4K monitors. It's just it's, – it's the next mm-hmm. step that they had to go, and the fact that they're bringing out half the price of a much higher-end card and officially more power, it's exciting. Right. And the <laughs> last product on our <laughs> list is I think maybe the most exciting one here. It's the Mego Flexible Tripod. Oh, you know, I, I didn't even look this up. One second. <laughs> Let's put, I, I could describe it very, very easily. If Salvador Dali or Dr. Seuss designed a tripod, this would be it. <laughs> it's a tripod. It's bendable. It's flexible. You can wrap it around a pole or it's a branch. It's called a splat, and it's exactly oh, described. Oh, yes, I've seen it. it. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. It would actually make interesting headgear. 
Okay. Um, I've I seen have all it. kinds so of tripod, thoughts about that. Yeah. It looks pretty cool. Yeah. It does. It, it's like Salvador Dali's liquid clocks. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's I've, wonderful. I've seen this. Uh, it's, and, but however, there are many good applications for a tool like this. We look at them there. You say it's, it's a giggle and it's a gimmick, but no, you know what? I could see plenty of uses for that. It's, it's flat and they make it in different sizes. So if you're a GoPro and for your thing, um, for, for your SLR, you can so mold the tripod around whatever it is that you, that's what's kind it's of It's like moldable plastic. I mean, no, and it's sturdy Thick enough. slap bracelets. And that's really <laughs> right, exactly. what this thing is. <laughs> but it's sturdy and it'll it's, hold big, big yes. cameras. Too. Have you used yeah, it, yeah, yeah. John? No, no, I haven't used it. I'm just reading oh. the specs. Sorry. Nice. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean they, they have it like you wrap it around trees or poles and mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I, 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 I saw and this actually on a while It'll stand on its own too. Yeah, it's a tripod. Yeah. Well, it's like a quad Pod. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, to all of our listeners, we gave you plenty of an incentive to pay off your credit card so that you could fill it up again. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Levy. Thank you, Zev. And always thank you to John Harris and Jason Tables. Give us your opinions on Twitter at BH Photo Video with the hashtag BH Photo Podcast. And please rate and leave a review on iTunes. My name is Alan Weitz. Thank you so much for joining us today.